It's Brilliant. Well, hello everybody. I'm Liz Farrington, the Marketing Manager of Sensor City. Welcome to our Arrow Comes Home webinar series in partnership with Arrow Electronics. Today's session is going to be about 5G and connected technologies and the consideration that needs to be given when developing sensor applications and which networks would work best for you. We will be joined today by two guest speakers from Arrow's network both tech vendors and electronics experts. They'll each give a 30 minute presentation with the opportunity for questions and answers following their main presentation. So do use the chat function that you can find within Teams to post the questions as you hear the presentations and then the speakers will address these points when they come to the end of their presentations. If I could ask please that all microphones are muted, um, but do use the chat function to communicate with us throughout the session. We are recording the webinar today, um, which will give you an opportunity to listen again if you thoroughly enjoyed it, or equally for anyone who is unable to join us live today, they can catch up at a later time. So it's great that we've got a number of people joining us today, um, quite a lot of international delegates. So I think we've got people registered from as far afield as the Philippines and Australia. So welcome to everybody who is in the Liverpool City region or beyond. It's great to have a mix of companies and students with us today. So hopefully you'll all be able to get um, some knowledge and insight from 5G and connected technologies from today's session. So the first of our speakers today is Charles Mitchell from Qualtech. Um, he will be covering 5G and how this fits in with other networks that are available. And then he'll be followed by Mark Dunnett from NXP, who will cover IoT networking protocols for sensor applications. So first of all, I'll hand it over to Charles from Quectel. Thank you. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Lovely, and if I put the screen on, so we should now be able to see my screen okay? Perfect. Lovely, okay, Coming so through. good morning everybody. Um, just to Brief introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Charles Mitchell. Um, I'm a UK and Ireland Regional Sales Director, Director for Quectel Wireless Solutions. Um, I'm a relatively new starter in, in Quectel. I've been here just, uh, just under two months, uh, but I'm a 12-year veteran uh, working in cellular um, and wireless uh, technologies. Um, so uh, hopefully we, 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 we can walk through things as we, as we go. Um, the, the, the agenda for today is a very quick uh, overview of who Quectel are and, uh, and, and why, why we're here. Um, I'll then go through a quick overview of what 5G is and, 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 and kind of give you an indication of the differences between uh, high speed and, and IoT needs um, and uh, obviously the Quectel product offering um, and then the Quec and, and, uh, an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. Uh, brief introduction then about Quectel. Uh, Quectel is a, is a um, Chinese company. Uh, we're currently leading the, the, the market in terms of supply of cellular uh, and GNSS modules. Uh, we cover a very broad portfolio starting as we did from GNSS uh, and 2G modules, um, going through 3G, 4G, uh, LPWA and now, now into, into 5G technologies. Our products are widely deployed across the industry from smartphones, smart meters, um, robotic uh, appliances for, for the home uh, and, and, and energy meters and everything else in between. Um, as a company, we're quite a young company uh, in this marketplace. Uh, we, were, we were only founded in 2010, so we're just under 10 years old, but we've seen phenomenally quick growth during that period. Uh, we've got four design centers, uh, two um, in China, Shanghai and, and Hebei in, uh, are the main two centers. Uh, we are just in the process of fully staffing up a, a new design centre uh, in Belgrade and also in Vancouver. Uh, one of the significant events for us last year was we became fully IPO'd um, in China um, and that was subsequently followed by uh, listings on Hong Kong. So overseas investors can also invest in the Quetel company. We've got over 50 sales officers uh, and more than 90 distributors, including Aero uh, as a, in our distribution channel. Um, and we've got now just over 1,500 employees worldwide. Um, 
part of our remit is to support our customers on, on a global basis and to support them wherever we can. Uh, we have nearly 20 individual sales officers now in Europe. Most of those, of course, are home offices rather than physical bricks and mortar premises. Um, and we also have good, good and strong coverage through North America and, as you'd expect, through Asia and South Pacific. Our product range, as I mentioned, covers everything from 2G, uh, 3G LTA and the low power Wi-Fi, but we also cover um, for specific applications, uh, a range of automotive products um, and for um, particularly for LTE products at the moment, we have a range of smart modules that incorporate everything from an Android 10 processor, cellular engine, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth all within a single chip module. These are very highly capable modules and but, but very much kind of part of the next generation of smartphones and, and smart systems, uh, particularly where people are looking to deploy uh, systems where, where we're using edge and edge technologies for, for, for computing power um, in the sensors. We are, like everybody else, um, a, a, a uh, fabulous manufacturer. Uh, we use some of the biggest manufacturing facilities possible in China, uh, using Kizda and Flex being our main two. But then we also have uh, offshore operations in Brazil, Malaysia, and we're looking at expanding further, uh, further and wider um, over over the coming years to to expand our, our manufacturing portfolio. As I mentioned, we have a, a approximately a production capacity of approximately nine million modules a month. Uh, and in order to help facilitate that, uh, we built a fully automated production line process uh, for efficiency in our manufacturing. Um, I'm not going to share it on, on this uh, course, but uh, on, on the PDF that we'll be sharing later, there, there is a link to our automated uh, video, uh, our, our automated production line, which is it is quite impressive. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that really helps drive our manufacturing capability. On the flip side of that is once we've got the product out of the door, um, you need to manufacture the product to, to meet standards and to work with network operators. And um, We have been uh, very fortunate to have a number of significant technology partners in the likes of Qualcomm and MediaTek, um, ST and, and uh, High Silicon over the years, but also we work very closely with all the networks. All our modules are appropriately approved by for the regulatory bodies, be that PTCRB, CE. Uh, we follow obviously Rojas uh, compliance, um, and, and we have uh, most of our modules uh, approved as required. To give you a bit of an idea in terms of the the physical size of the company. Um, we, as I said, we, we have some very significant growth um, over the last few years. Um, last year, we shipped just over 76 million pieces, uh, ranging from, as I say, from 2G GNSS all the way up to uh, LTE Advanced. Um, and uh, we had a revenue last year of uh, ju just under $600 million. This puts us as, as the largest cellular module manufacturer, both by volume and by value, something which we will continue to expand on during the next couple of years. One of the key things from a cocktail perspective is actually supporting and supporting our customers. We have a very large number of modules. And we are keen to work with customers through the entire design cycle um, and production cycle, starting with your design concepts and helping select the most appropriate modules for, for an application or for a system, assistance with design ins um, and design reviews. Um, we also have the test facilities. Um, and if required, we can also help with mass production using uh, some of our on ongoing facilities. That kind of concludes a little bit of an overview of, of, of what Quetel is. And then let's now look at uh, what 5G is. Well, what is 5G? Well, Wikipedia very helpfully gives us a, a simple description of 5G. Uh, and it describes it as the fifth generation of cellular network technology. Well, that's very helpful. Not exactly descriptive, but it is accurate. Um, the one big thing about 5G compared to previous generations of technology is that uh, there is there is compatibility between the previous generation and the previous bearers. So between 2G and 3G, there was a complete new bearer architecture and the products were completely incompatible. The same between 3G and 4G. Between 4G and 5G, as, we, as I'll explore later on in the deck, um, there is a complete compatibility between 4G and 5G. And in fact, 4G forms part of the 5G standards. 
The other thing about 5G, and it's a very sad state of affairs that we have to actually even consider to mention this, but 5G is not the root of COVID-19 transmission, despite the rumours, despite uh, all of the um, con the conspiracy theories and everything else that is floating around on the internet. It is definitely a radio transmission and not a virus transmission. So if we now look at uh, some of the innovation that's gone along with the, with, with the cellular modules, and this is this this could almost be viewed here as a timeline uh, moving from left to right, uh, with the earliest devices on the left and the later devices on the right. Um, not strictly true because the Cat One devices did actually appear in the marketplace sometime after Cat Four and Cat Six devices, but generally the trend is the same. And as you look at the the modules and the the, the bearer types as we move across the screen here, as you move from from Cat1 through to 5G, you increase the complexity of the devices, you increase the throughput of the devices, and also, as you would expect, you're, incomplete, you're increasing the cost of the devices. But this, this, this kind of um, broadband and, and consumer broadband war for cellular, uh, cellular tech, bear, bearer technology doesn't fit well for marketplaces that were previously well suited to uh, to 2G and even 3G uh, applications where you, know, you really wanted a, a, a low cost per unit, simple to use devices, and if possible, a, a, a simple global device which you could deploy. So that then derived a, a secondary track to the, to the 5G and to the uh, cellular innovation track to produce simplified hardware with lower power and lower cost. And from that, we came up with um, the, the range of products, which is largely grouped together as a LPWA or low power wide area network products. And this is the LPWA is, is, a, is a, a combined term that is used to combine the term for CAD-M and for narrowband IoT. We focus a little bit on the top end of the uh, the, the technology roadmap and how things developed. Uh, if we look at the LTE, the LTE Pro, Pro uh, evolution, what we see is some of the technologies that are behind the ability to drive higher and faster speeds as we move through. So if we look at the LTE Cat3, Cat3, Cat4 type devices, these are capable of around 100 megabits downlink. You use a simple one by one or one by two uh, MIMO or some single antenna solutions to actually do the data transmission. And at this end, you're looking at around five or 10 megahertz worth of channel bandwidth. And then as you move through the through the different technologies and through through the the last few years, what we've seen is we've got more carrier aggregation. So this is where you take individual channels and individual bands that the uh, networks have been uh, allocated as part of spectrum organize, uh, spectrum auctions and consolidate that to create a bigger, fatter pipe. You get more carrier aggregation, so we end up with one by one one by uh, one, one channel here at, at the lower end, ranging all the way up to uh, up to five carrier aggregation channels uh, when you get to LTE Advanced Pro, and that carries forward into 5G. That gives you an overall increase in terms of the spectrum and we get that availability. You have more antennas. So you have more diversity, you can carry more through the various channels. And then you also have higher modulation going from 64 QAM, uh, the baseline here, uh, all the way up to 1024 QAM in 5G. Uh, overall, that gives you a much better, um, uh, much improved capability to transport data. And then 5G also, uh, 3GP and IT, ITU uh, defined two new radio standards, uh, or two radio standards for 5G. Um, there is 5G LTE, which is sometimes referred to as LTE Advanced Pro. Uh, this is uh, part of the 3GPP release 15. This gives you up to CAD 18, CAD 20. Um, technologies in terms of bearer speeds. But more, more significantly, this is what the, 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 the buzz is really around is around 5G, is around 5G new radio. This new radio requires new infrastructure, new cell sites, and increases the frequency uh, at which uh, the, the, the cellular connections are made on, uh, typically running around three and a half gig, uh, often referred to as sub six gigahertz for uh, free communications. And also the other thing which the, the, the 5G new radio brings in um, is millimeter wave technologies. 
uh, which will give up to 20 or even 40 gigabits per second downlink speeds. The other thing, and this is uh, something which I'm not going to cover here because it, it really is a very deep and very complex uh, topic, um, is that the 5G standards, particularly around the new radio, introduce a lot of operational improvements and infrastructure changes um, at the network core level. Um, as a user, you will never see this. And this is all about network optimization and network efficiency. Um, and it is this 5G core network that is part of the ongoing uh, governmental challenges and discussions about should Chinese companies such as Hawaii be allowed access to, to manage uh, the other 5G core networks. But the one key thing that comes from this is that there is a full compatibility between LTE and 5G. We're looking now a little bit at some of those features that the five, that the Reese 15 5G brings us, and some of you can start to see some of this in terms of the, the technologies that we see today. Um, so we see the high reliability and low latency as part of the, the five or 5G LTE standards. Uh, massive machine type communications for LPWA, vehicle to vehicle to everything communications. Um, and licensed and unlicensed spectrums of LAA, LAA in Europe or CBRS in North America starts to become part of the access technologies that, that, that come as part of the 5G LTE standard. And the 5G, 5G NR standards brings in ultra low latency, multi gigabit downlink speeds and ultra high reliability. Looking at commercial deployment, this is a note generally, uh, what we see uh, in the marketplace is that uh, from standardization to network availability it's typically one to two years before you start to see um, the networks being able to support these standards and what we will always see is the consumer devices so these are the devices that will have 12 to 18 months life cycle will be the devices that typically turn up in the marketplace first and this is very much true you see today with 5G, today's 5G chipsets, um, it's using a core, they all may all mainly using a Qualcomm chipset that is considered by Qualcomm as a short term solution to, to 5G. Um, most of the modules, industrial I, and, and IoT product solutions will be based on the second generation chipsets uh, from Qualcomm and from others. And those devices will typically start to appear in the marketplace some six to 12 months after network availability. So what that means is we're starting to be, be beyond the cusp of seeing a large scale industrial rollout and adoption of 5G and 5G technologies. One of the things which you see often within, uh, I mentioned often within, within 5G and 5G terminology is uh, two terms, which is standalone and non-standalone. Uh, the difference between the two architectures is, is essentially standalone or uh, makes use of a 5G core network. Currently, that is not what is, what is being deployed uh, generically in, in most marketplaces. Most marketplaces are using non-standalone architecture. And here in non-standalone architecture, your 5G NR radio either links back into um, an LTE network to actually transmit the data through the evolved packet core and into the 4G network core, or uh, has a direct connection from the NR radio directly into the evolved packet core. This is why, um, why, why we're both very confident to, to tell you that 4G LTE will continue to be an integral part of 5G and 5G solutions moving forward. Now the consideration as you start to look at 5G and the millimeter wave antenna, millimeter, millimeter wave product um, is that this starts to bring in some very new technology and it's very different from everything that previously has been used um, in, in cellular communications. We're looking at very wide bands uh, up, to, uh, up to and greater than 100 megahertz and, and doing that at lower cost. Millimeter wave leverages beam forming um, and, and, and MIMO. Typically, you would need a minimum of four antennas, uh, four MIMO antennas, to, to uh, get your millimeter wave um, solution built. And the other thing which is, which is very significant is that millimeter wave has a, a limited range. Um, 
some estimates are around 200 meters. Um, certainly the highest estimates I've seen in papers I've read has been up to 500 meters, which means that you're looking for a very high density of millimeter wave cells or repeaters to actually be able to, to put this together. So what you start to see is that sports stadiums um, and, and areas where there are very high density of people is particularly where you're gonna see millimeter wave deployment. That is a complete new infrastructure. There's more antennas, and more cell sites needed to be able to roll that out. So we're going to see a very slow rollout. On the module perspective, uh, these millimeter wave antennas, and there's a picture on the on the on the screen here of one of the Qualcomm QTM525 antennas. Uh, they use a different interface, uh, so there is more of a broadband uh, communications protocol. It's not just an RF uh, connection between uh, baseband. Uh, processor and the and, and the radio antenna. What this means, uh, and in conjunction with the beamforming, is that antennas will need to be tuned to individual applications, which increases the complexity and also cost and time to market for these antenna systems, antenna-based systems. So the key take key, key takeaway here is millimeter wave support is complex. Uh, we will support it, but it is going to be something that will be uh, NRE supported. Uh, because of the beam forming and because of the range, it's not a great fit for mobile applications. And the other significant thing to consider is that there's not necessarily a full global rollout planned uh, for millimeter wave technology. You know, the UK and Vodafone talk about this being as a possibility to consider for the future. We now start to look at a little bit more of the applications uh, for 5G. And these can be uh, grouped into, into several different categories. So you start to see at one end where you have a large number of large number or high density of solutions with smart city, uh, multi gigabit uh, applications, so server farms, uh, offloading systems uh, into the cloud, um, high speed video and and, uh, and and entertainment systems need, uh, excuse me, need high speed of the enhanced mobile broadband. And then you end up at the other end of the system where you're looking at the ultra, ultra reliable and low latency communications. So mission critical uh, applications, so guidance systems for drones, uh, industrial or process automation, or even the self-driving car. But then look, break that down further just to have a look at the key technologies that are required for each of those. So if we look at the massive machine type communications or massive IoT, the key requirements there is the high density, it's low cost, it's low power and it's high coverage. And the radio technologies that we're going to be using to, to cover that is the LTEM and narrowband IoT. And those are technologies that are available today. Um, the enhanced mobile broadband is uh, looking for high speed. Um, high peak speed, high average speed, is looking ultimately for high capacity. Um, for this, you'll be looking at the 5G new radios and or LTE or LTE advanced to be able to cover that. And the final area uh, is the critical ultra low latency uh, uh, end of the marketplace. This needs low latency, high reliability and very high mobility capabilities. So this is your cell to cell handovers and transfers. For this, you need 5G core and then running uh, NR or LTE on top of that 5G core. In terms of availability then, what that means is we're going to see a progressive rollout of these technologies. So we start to see with today, we're looking at the massive IoT and the consumer LTE advanced and 5G products using LTM, uh, narrowband IoT and, 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 and the existing infrastructure. They're, they're launched today and rolling out today. Uh, and will continue to be evolved as, as we move into the future. The enhanced mobile broadband, uh, this is products that are starting to be launched now. Uh, you see this with the 5G smartphones that are coming into the marketplace and very shortly 5G products for, for technology. Uh, the mission critical IoT is something which will actually probably not really start to be properly deployed into commercial networks until around 2016, uh, sorry, until around 2022-2023. In terms of deployment, um, the, there's been a number of bands that have been chosen across the world. Um, what we see, uh, and this is the, the difference in, in naming technologies, anything uh, that is using so-called 5G NR has an N prefix to the band numbers. Uh, bands in the range uh, up to 79, I believe it is, uh, or all what is called sub six gigahertz. And the millimeter wave stuff is all um, typically uh, in the in the in the 200 plus range. 
So what we see is the deployment is across the world. Uh, there are some similarities in this. The uh, the, N, the N78, which is three and a half gigahertz band, is common across both Europe and North America and into Asia. So there starts to be a little bit more international play and how, how uh, the uh, alignment between the networks and the network operators. Looking now at uh, the, the other end of the marketplace uh, is the is, is LPWA and how that fits. And if you look at uh, any anything from from the internet for the last five years, you've seen that the uh, amount of connectivity that is planned in the so-called Internet of Things is just huge, going from around 300 million connected devices in 2015 up to estimates of up to 5 billion connected devices um, in 2025. Some of that is going to be cellular and some of that will use other communications technologies. And part of that gives you a, 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 a good spread of the different low power wide area technologies. There are a range of products that we as Quetel don't particularly cover, which is the, the ad hoc networks. These are typically proprietary networks, and these include things like LoRa, Sigfox, and Ingenu. And then there is the cellular networks. Uh, so there's 2G, and particularly the areas of um, LPWA that we're looking at is the LTE CAT M1 and the and, and narrowband IoT. As an overview, some of the advantages between uh, the, the cellular uh, LPWA over, over the proprietary ones, uh, there is better coverage. This is this is not specifically talking about how well the devices work, but it's talking about the, the, net, the network availability. Um, the infrastructure, cell towers and masts, core networks, etc., are all largely in place. Um, it's a, it's I hate to say it, but it's largely just a software update to, to implement a lot of the connectivity. Um, there's massive connections. Uh, the density uh, supported by cellular technologies is great. Uh, obviously, there's the mobility component within cellular, which is not a, not, not particularly there with, with other radio technologies. We have low cost and we have low power consumption. Um, another aspect that, that is considered uh, for, for some, some applications, important for some applications, is the ability to use voice. Um, and voice over LTE is supported within the uh, CATM standards, um, it, but it's going to be down to all individual networks to actually roll that out or not. Current consumption, obviously, very important uh, for, for a device uh, and, and in terms of how it operates. Um, with, a, with, with the lower power consumption, uh, you can have smaller batteries, um, you can improve the user experience, and you need fewer, fewer field visits to actually maintain uh, a, a deployed system. Looking at how you can achieve the power consumption, there are two aspects to, to uh, low power, uh, cellular, low power. Uh, one is to use a offline mode or power save, power save mode. This is we use typically where a device is sending data infrequently, once a day or maybe once a week. Um, the key thing to note about this is that the equipment is not reachable while it's in the off mode. Any target application will here would include patient monitoring or simple smoke sensors, um, smart city, static type devices. The other, the other aspect and the way you can actually manage this is to use an online uh, mode uh, using UDRX and here the module will go to to sleep based on a network uh, requirement, um, and it can be reachable from the network. I'm going to skip over that one. Um, the, the coverage, obviously, this is a very important thing, and this is a very significant part of uh, one of part of the rationale around LPWA. Um, the, one of the challenges we face currently with LTE, 3G and 2G is indoor penetration and also uh, range from base stations. Uh, for the RF device, what you're looking at um, is, a, is, a, is a figure which actually starts to give some estimate on terms of the cover coverage, which is called the maximum coupling loss. Uh, for cellular LPWA, you can reach up to 164 dB uh, of max maximum coupling loss. Um, conventional networks are down at 144. That gives you around a 20 dB gain. Uh, what that means is you can get better penetration. Um, so you end up with uh, increased range. Um, or uh, increased penetration. So if you look at some typical materials, you know, you look at glass is a 2, B, 2 dB loss, uh, a wooden wall can be up to 3 dB loss and up to a concrete uh, wall like we would see in a typical building, uh, you can see up to, up to 35 dB loss. 
that makes a very significant difference on how far your signal will, trans will, will travel into a uh, building, making LPW an ideal solution for smart meters, for instance, where they may be mounted in the basement of systems. Another aspect which um, LPW has introduced is so enhancement techniques. So it's half duplex communications, we increase repetitions, um, and there are some significant other network level technologies that are there to improve the overall coverage um, and the, the, the signal or signal to noise uh, capability within the devices. Also starts to look like there's a bit of an LPWA technology war coming here because we, we look at narrowband IoT and, and CAT-M, both of which seem to be very similar. Um, in actual fact, they are very similar devices and, and both have very similar capabilities. And it's very much like the VHS versus Betamax war from the 80s. Both do a very good job and will cover the technology admirably in both cases. Narrowband has some, some advantages and dis differences between itself and, and CAT-M. You know, it typically supports lower data rates, so only 100 kilobits per second downlink and uplink. There is no mobility component and it has a higher latency. M1, on the other hand, you have um, a much greater uplink speed, up to one megabit per second uplink speed, um, and it's LTE based. So the cell handovers are possible. You have lower latency and also it's voice capable. The critical thing, and often as, as is the case also with the VH versus Betamax war, is the biggest inflow is actually what is deployed by the major network operators in the region in which you're going to deploy. That is going to really decide what technology you're going to be used or going to be able to use. Something which I'd also add as a, as a side comment here is that um, many MVNOs offer the connectivity um, for LPWA, but not necessarily the low power features. Um, and they are often withheld by the MNOs. Um, and obviously, um, at the moment, narrowband uh, roaming is limited. Um, there's a chart here which shows the uh, the overall deployment of, of uh, network LPWA networks. And what we see is that, generically speaking, there is very little coverage now where there is just an LTEM network. Uh, the US was predominantly um, LTEM and it's now covering both LTEM and narrowband IoT. China and Asia uh, are very much narrowband IoT focused, but most of the rest of the world is focusing on, on, on dual technologies. And you see that with some of the trends in terms of the network deployments over the last few years uh, with, with more networks, in, particularly in Asia, have been deployed around narrowband IoT, but uh, CAT-M is catching up and they are on the same overall growth trend. If I now focus very quickly on some of the, the products and the product roadmaps that the tech, that Quetel have got coming forward, we have a full roadmap of uh, the supports uh, from CAT6 LTE in a number of form factors from surface mount to plug in either M2 or mini PCIe form factor cards. And we go from, uh, as I say, CAT6 modules all the way up to 5, 5, 5G modules. On the 5G product, uh, we have two specific CASAs. We have the first range which we were launching, which is the sub gigahertz only, uh, both in the uh, service mount and an M2 form factor product. And later on this year, we will have um, the, the product which is launched with the millimeter wave capabilities as well, which is the 510 series. I won't go through that uh, just at this stage. Uh, but the 5, 5, 5G and, and for all of our products, we have ranges of, of development kits and support packages available to help develop and support the applications. Applications for 5G tend to be uh, focused towards high bandwidth. So we're looking at uh, gigabit routers, uh, CPE type uh, promise, uh, CPE type products, VoIP routers, etc. things that need very high data speeds. Um, we've recently done a number of press releases where we've got customers using 5G for um, mobile video and broadcast video uplink. Laptops, another key application, uh, and again, security and surveillance. As we move forward into the next generation, as we start to move towards millimeter wave stuff, that will start to bring in other new applications. So for, for instance, AR, drone delivery services and flexible manufacturing um, and manufacturing capabilities. One of the interesting things about 5G millimeter wave is that the penetration is so poor. Some customers are actually looking at and considering to deploy 5G millimeter wave as a factual tomato solution because the, 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 the signals won't actually penetrate outside factory walls, so enabling an, an, an enhanced level of private network security. On the LPWA on our side, we have a range of modules. Uh, 
covering different technologies and using different uh, manufacturers. So uh, our, our primary global range is the Qualcomm range, which supports um, CAD-M, narrowband, um, 2G solutions, um, and as at least uh, truly global solutions. And then we have more specific focus solutions towards narrowband IoT from MediaTek, HiSilic, and the Unisoc. These devices typically uh, will, will support the higher bandwidth capabilities of M1, so 5K, 580 downlink, and up to a meg down, meg uplink, um, and obviously support um, the, the necessary fallbacks to cover for the applications and for the networks that aren't quite caught up to support it. Um, applications that support LP, LPWA, the main applications, public utilities, smart cities, smart life, so asset tracking and wearables and the smart home. These are all markets that we're starting to, to actively develop and be engaged with. So smart, smart metering is a fantastic example for this. Um, this, this is estimated to be approximately 1.9 billion connected meters um, by the by 20, end of 2024. Um, and these will be machines that will be connected using uh, largely cellular communications now based on, uh, on CATM or narrowband IoT depending on, on market. Street lighting is another major at, at, uh, category where people are now looking to put uh, intelligent street light control uh, uh, so you can report for luminaire failure uh, but also you can vary the lightness dynam dynamically um, accor according to, to need. The smart home again this is this is uh, as a replacement or an augmentation to uh, Wi-Fi, uh, what you start to see is that the large number of people are starting to look at how to integrate solutions uh, and make it simple for people to install. So it's plug and play, it's easy to install, and you don't need to work out how to pair this to, to your Wi-Fi router. And that extends to external devices such as robo mowers, where clearly uh, having your Wi-Fi network in the garden is less efficient and, and in many cases not actually physically possible. So if we now move very quickly to, to some frequent asked questions, uh, looking at now the 5G and R on the enhanced mobile broadband. Uh, so when will 5G services be available? Well, the first networks are available now uh, and um, rolling out focused on the enhanced mobile broadband. Do you as a customer or designer need to wait for 5G? No, uh, the high data rates LTEA and LTE Advanced Pro products are available now. Um, LTE Advanced will, will form part and does form part of a key, the part of the infrastructure for many years to come. You also consider um, part of the cost between 5G and LTEA. Uh, to give it to give you some some idea, uh, a catch 12 module uh, will be approximate will be of the order of about $100, and a 5G sub G sub six module is currently going to be around $320. So there's a very significant financial investment required to jump up to 5G. The 5G modules, as we noted, now uh, they'll be available. Typically now, uh, we're shipping the, the sub-6 modules from Q2 and the millimetre wave modules from the end of this year. Uh, for LPWA and IoT, um, 5G LPWA use cases are already supported using narrowband IoT and cat -M. You don't need to wait for a specific 5G LPWA. And the 5G use cases, uh, 5G NR, uh, typically will not get supported with, with LPWA. Um, this has been reviewed several times. Uh, and when you start to look at the 5G NR radios uh, operating typically at three and a half gigahertz, that is not conducive to, to low power or high building penetration. Um, narrowband 2 or MB2 is often seen now on our data sheets. Um, the primary differences um, is it uh, has, a higher, has a higher data rate, so offering uh, up to 150k uplink versus the 65k uplink uh, for NB1. So in quick summary, uh, 5G is a system of components comprising high speed, low latency, coverage and coverage density. The 5G network and modules are here now, ready for use. The primary focus, as I said, is for 5G and 5G NR is towards uh, the, the high data speed, data, in data intensive applications, and the millimeter wave applications will, will come in the near future. For LPWA, um, LTEM and narrowband IT are 5G. Uh, they are the only 5G technologies that are supported in this use case and will be continued for the future. And Quactel is here ready to support your applications uh, and needs now. Uh, I've included here a couple of references uh, which, which you can read to read, read, read afterwards um, in terms of some of uh, the overview of 5G 
and also the presentation of 5G NR, uh, massive machine type communications. And obviously all of the Quectel product guides and data information can be found on quectel.com. Um, that's it for my, my presentation. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions that I can try and answer this stage. I think there were a few more general questions. Um, there was a question posted asking whether the slides would be shared. So yes, I can confirm that after the session, we will be circulating the slides from the, from the presenters and also a link to the webinar for you to watch. Um, again. <laughs> um, another question was regarding certification. Um, there isn't any official Oh, sorry, if you can still hear me there. There isn't any official certification related to the webinar. Um, it's not part of an accredited course or training session. Um, but, you know, hopefully it's more of a general insight um, into the kind of networks and um, products that are required for kind of IoT innovations in, in the field that we're discussing. Um, if anyone does have any specific questions about Charles's specific presentation, please do ask them now. We can always come back to them um, at the end. I think the frequently asked questions that you just put up on the slides there was really helpful. So that might have covered what people had in their minds already. No problem. Brilliant. So if there are no further questions, then we will move on to Mark Dunnett from NXP, please. Sure, just bear with me and I will share my slides. I think there's there's one question um, from Mitsu Asaito um, regarding Quectel. Um, just what is the volume of the LPWA uh, product shipment globally by Quectel um, have outside of China? I think, uh, Charles, you covered that in your slides at the start, didn't you? I did. Um, let me see if I can manage to get any information um, during the during the during the session, um, and uh, I'll I'll go see if I can get you with the, an estimate. Um, the volume inside China is massive in comparison to to volume outside China, and that's because of the uh, primarily because of the um, network availability and the network readiness in China. China has, has, has clearly stolen a march on the rest of the world by by about 18 months in terms of commercial deployment of networks. But I'll see if I can try and find an estimate during, during the next presentation. Yeah, you can, you can always ask in the, in the chat as well. Yeah. Uh, with me? Mark? Yeah, it's all right. My um... I think I'm sharing the whole of my screen, which is probably not quite what would be helpful. Let me try this one and do that one. Good. Perhaps um, you just let me know if uh, you can see my screen coming through. OK. Yep. Yeah, we can. Fantastic. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Liz, for the, uh, the introduction earlier. My name's Mark Dunnett, and I work for Arrow Electronics as an embedded microcontroller specialist. Um, my experience has been mostly with the NXP product portfolio. And what my plan today is to give you um, an overview of some IoT radio systems that might be suitable for, for sensor networks. And I'll kind of touch on things like Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Thread, Bluetooth, low energy, and, and other things. Uh, but this is very much a practical kind of presentation. So rather than lecturing on those standards, um, I want to address how you might select which radio um, protocol you use for your IoT sensor application. You know, where do you go to get started? How can you get software to kind of bootstart your design? And talk about some of the complexities of uh, IoT sensor networks. Um, I've allowed 45 minutes. I plan to talk for about 30 minutes and leave some space for questions at the end. Again, if you'd like to ask questions, then put them in the chat as I'm going through and um, we can address them um, at the end. 
and again, if I can remind everybody to put your um, uh, microphone on mute, um, there has been some background noise which um, may distract the other listeners. So fantastic. Well, um, here's a slide which is very commonly uh, put up all about um, the connected world. Um, IoT has a concept of bringing everything connected and there's been a dramatic growth of connected devices. Everything smart, so now I can control the lights in my bedroom from uh, my Alexa speaker um, in my bedroom so I don't have to get out of bed to um, to turn my lights on and off. Um, all very clever. I'm not sure how smart that is, but it's a, you know, it's a example of a connected world. And I won't touch on it really in this presentation, but secure as all of these networks become um, more and more connected and smart. Uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have to embed security into our product to prevent the, uh, the hacking attack and road actors stealing our uh, yeah, our code or worse the the reputational damage that um, you know this network from this vendor is uh, is very easy to be hacked so as you're considering your iot sensor network um, i would say start with security don't try and build that in later start from the very beginning with security OK, so we're going to connect everything and we're going to have this wonderful sensor network. Um, right now on my desk, I have a um, um, an IOT network for the agricultural industry, Agritech for um, putting sensors in rural fields where there's no phone signal. I've got a, a satellite radio schematic for um, a continental wide telemetry of tracking something kind of that's crossing a continent based on a satellite uh, telemetry system. And I've got a smart water meter, um, which is connected over a um, Wi-Fi AC um, network. Um, so everything's connected, um, but how how should I connect my, uh, my system? Um, and there's no shortage of standards and protocols and marketing organizations and bodies that can um, provide IoT sensor networks. And the question is, well, yeah, these are all available, but which one should I choose? Why should I pick LoRa? Why should I pick Wi-Fi? Why do I need Zigbee? What's the advantage of uh, Bluetooth? Well, there's no shortage of guidance from all of these bodies. Um, you know, there's lots of material that you can go and research online. And they're very good at telling you what the underlying physical layer is and therefore what the bandwidth might be or what the, um, uh, you know, what the properties of the network are. But, but nothing really kind of tells you which one to pick. And, and of course, all of these organizations have got big marketing bodies behind them. So if you pick thread will that cost you money? If you pick Zigbee, do you have to pay a membership fee? Um, is there open source software that you can just pick up and use, or do you have to, to accept somebody's licensing agreement? Um, and of course, some of the decisions are obvious. You know, If your cloud interface is through a, a mobile phone, then almost certainly you need Bluetooth or possibly Wi-Fi. Um, if you've got a um, you know, a container that you're tracking globally, then maybe a cellular network with narrowband IoT is the solution and you don't have much more to think about. But maybe you've got a deployment of sensors in a home or that are worn on a body or in a metropolitan area. Which network or which standard do you go for? And that's what I'm going to address really as we go through. I take a view from the developer's perspective. So I'm developing an IoT system and I don't particularly care about Zigbee or a mesh network or, you know, Wi-Fi. I care about these topics. I care about the size of the hardware and the complexity of the hardware. Where will I get the software from? Um, what bandwidth is available and what bandwidth do I need for my sensor? How much data will I send and how often? Um, what about power consumption? Am I going to be turning a cellular radio on every day and 
blasting a big packet out and going to sleep for 24 hours? Or do I need to be always on? What's the range? You know, what kind of radio topology is my sensor network? And these are all the practical things that we have to start with. And my advice would be, don't pick a standard because you've seen the marketing publicity, but think about the implications for your sensor network. What do you need and which standard best fits your requirements? So let's illustrate that with these two kind of connected topics, range and topology. And when I'm talking to clients about um, IoT sensor networks, range is always the first question that people ask me. Mark, if I use protocol XYZ, Zigbee, what range will I get? Um, well, there's no answer for that, uh, other than the range will be less than what you want or what you need. Um, range is always a limiting factor. And um, as we learned from the Quectel um, you know, presentation, uh, there's this insertion loss as the radio signals go through concrete glass material. So the range is always less than you want. And then, well, yeah, Mark, yeah, but what, yeah, go on. I know it's less than I want, but what is the range? Well, range is an impossible to answer question because we need to put some parameters on it. What type of antenna? What insertion loss will there be? Are you inside a house or outside in a you know, vast 100 acre agricultural field with a line of sight? Um, is there a battery by the radio that's detuning it and making it less efficient? Um, and all these things kind of, uh, it's impossible to answer the question about range. Um, a good way to find out range though would be to go to a trade show and ask a, a board vendor to prove the range to you. Um, I remember a, a time at Mobile World Congress when I was demonstrating Zigbee and a thousand other companies were in the same massive hall with their Zigbee and thread and Wi-Fi and cellular radios all on and demonstrating. And it was impossible to get a signal through, um, even in an ISM band um, like uh, Zigbee is using. Um, so even if you can prove range, you don't own the spectrum. You don't have 100% access to the radio network when you want it. Um, you're sharing it with many, many other people. So range may always be compromised by retry and interference. And the only guidance I can give you is to um, conduct your own range tests in the environment that your sensor is going to be worn, it's going to be used in. So if it's a, a body worn, Bluetooth based um, network that's communicating to a, a mobile phone, try some Bluetooth modules and put them on the very large wet body that your body actually is full of water and find out how badly that detunes the radio. Uh, here's an example. Bluetooth um, is a slide distance range of 50 to 100 meters for Bluetooth low energy. Well, I don't believe that. Um, I'm wearing some uh, Bluetooth um, uh, headphones at the moment while I'm speaking, and I know if I walk 10 meters into the kitchen, I start to have a loss of signal. So um, don't take range at first value. I would say consider range, do some testing. But of course, actually, range starts to introduce the radio topology because um, we just need to define the types of network that we're introducing. So here's the very, very simple one, a point to point um, network, one transmitter, one receiver, maybe bidirectional. This is um, your Bluetooth phone to your Bluetooth headsets, or it might be um, a point to point uh, link across a vast agricultural field, very simple and might need a proprietary radio network, something very simple. Um, here's practically Bluetooth. Um, my mobile phone's currently connected to my computer and to my headset and to my running watch and probably to um, other things. So this is a star network. One central master is sending information to and from nodes. Star network, uh, well, typically we see between two and 255 nodes. 
some radio networks are able to support many more. But that might be suitable for a, a small home-based network, maybe Wi-Fi. You got the Wi-Fi um, router and Wi-Fi connected sensors around the home. Um, how are you going to get your signals out and into the cloud? Here's what I call Star Connected. It's the same as the Star Network, but um, there's a link to uh, some uh, cloud connection. It might be a mobile phone, in which case that's likely to be Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. But it could be an Ethernet cable coming in um, to your um, central node carrying the IP network from a home router. Here's something a little bit more realistic, um, what I call a cluster tree network, where you've got nodes that are kind of in much more complex networks with routers and hosts and end nodes, maybe with some kind of um, cloud connection um, and backbone. Um, and this is a cluster tree. And the important topology thing to note here is that any one node is connected to any one other node only by one path. Um, if you were to take the linking the two blue pentagrams together, um, there's only one route through the network between these two. And that simplifies the addressing in the network. Of course, um, a star network um, was shown here on the left, um, one central body, um, only one route between uh, each node. Um, and we may contrast that with a mesh network, where here we see four different nodes with different routes from the left side to the right side. You could go up and across, or you can come down and across. Mesh networks are very attractive because they're, um, uh, they solve the problem of range. As long as your sensor can see a, a nearby sensor, then in principle, your packet can hop across the net, network, one hop to the next, and can transverse the network, and you can get a packet through from any one node to any other. Um, so that's like a relay function. Um, information is passed node to node. Uh, but this raises a problem. Um, how do you know that the, all the nodes are listening at the right time? Um, if one node transmits, then the neighboring nodes all have to be on and listening to be able to pick up that node. So we now need to kind of introduce in a mesh network the concept of synchronization. Does everything turn on at exactly the same time? And how do you compensate for drift in crystals? Or um, is everything always on? In which case, what effect does that have on your battery life? Um, or do you have powered up nodes that are there to listen and the end nodes power down? Um, so whilst a mesh network solves the problem of range, it does impose a great number of other challenges, uh, not only on power consumption and power management, but um, the concept of addressing needs to be considered. There are two different types of mesh. Um, one is a flood mesh, and these were quite common on Bluetooth low energy um, two or three years ago. And in this case, the transmitter, I show it here with the, uh, the speaker and uh, sending out a, a message, wants to send a, a packet to the other end of the mesh. In this case, um, every node has to be listening and able to relay it. And the packet gets to every single node. That's quite complex and suffers from very, very low bandwidth because every network, every node has to transmit the, uh, the pack, packet onto the next one. And that reduces the amount of throughput through the network. And it's got very, very poor power performance because every node has to be on all the time. Something like uh, Thread or Zigbee introduce an addressed mesh. Um, I contrast this with a flood mesh in that these addressed meshes are massively, extraordinarily complicated. Um, we've got addressing, we've probably got security, we've got to solve the always on conundrum. It does have an improved bandwidth, um, but these are very, very complex to install, probably needs commissioning, and you need to ensure that the the relay nodes 
are positioned in a place where they're not in a dead spot and they can always pick up the uh, the packets from your sensors. So don't believe that a mesh is the answer to every single problem. Um, adding a mesh solves range and then gives you two years of complex kind of um, network software to kind of work out um, and every network will need to be commissioned and installed by a trained operator. Um, meshes great technically, very poor from a um, deployment point of view. Um, just some examples to kind of make sense here. On the left end, point-to-point um, -point network, Bluetooth might be a very classic point-to-point -point network, or a, a, you know, LoRa might just be point-to-point. LoRa would though typically be a star network with a central router and um, deploying to uh, remote sensors um, with a range uh, with LoRa um, dependent on the um, uh, you know, on the network that you're going through. Um, Sigfox might be better um, with uh, several kilometers of range. Star connected um, Bluetooth there again uh, could be Wi-Fi with a cell phone um, as the cloud connectivity. In the cluster tree here, I'm showing Zigbee, uh, perhaps with a Wi-Fi link from a router to the cloud and um, to your home router, and probably Bluetooth being the connection between the uh, uh, kind of relay node um, and being used for configuring and um, deploying the network. Uh, two other examples here. Um, Flood mesh um, that could be based on Bluetooth smarts. I'm thinking, you know, 4.2 or um, BLE um, 5. The addressed mesh here, classically um, thread, um, open thread, or um, Bluetooth smarts at 5.2 um, with a, a more kind of addressing capability. Um, but these mesh networks are very, very complex. Uh, here's a quick topology of thread. Thread um, or open thread is a, an open standard and everything in the network is based on uh, IP um, messaging. So the end devices shown in the, uh, the little blue circles um, carry IP and the only thing they know about is their router that they're connected to. They typically be sleepy, they go to sleep and wake up and then send messages to their thread router, shown in the uh, orange um, uh, pentagram or pentangle, I suppose. And um, the thread router would classically be always on. There'd be some element of the network, the leader, which is kind of the owner of the network, and that may have a connection to one or more border routers to give access to um, the full IP network and get sensor data out and into the cloud. Much more of a complex network, all IP based and addressed. What effect does that have on power consumption? Well, um, I explained some of the complexities with, uh, with meshes, um, how to ensure that the nodes are listening. You know, how are you going to be on? Well, classically in a network like Thread, then I've shown here the, that the core network is mains powered. Um, you can see that um, the, the router, the leader, the border routers are likely to be on and powered all at the same time. Fantastic in a home environment where there's a mains plug in every room, not so good in a exhibition hall or in a maybe even a hotel or a retail outlet where you may not have easy access to mains exactly where you want to place a, uh, a router or a, a border router. And certainly not suitable for uh, agri-tech implementation where we're trying to monitor crops growing in a field without mains power, or I suppose we could install very large batteries to um, maintain those networks. And always on, we're probably talking 100, 200 milliamps for a, um, a leader router um, or a, um, certainly a border router. Um, and if you've got to have a 100 milliamps on all the time, you can do the calculations for the size of the battery that's needed 
and how often you need to send someone out to change those batteries. Uh, Bluetooth power, um, this is right the other end of the spectrum. Here I show um, uh, some measurements I conducted uh, based on a, um, a very low power Bluetooth radio, it's called a QN9080 with a um, Cortex M4 core um, available from NXP. Um, and we can see that kind of when we're advertising um, in BLE, the radio is consuming about 2.5 milliamps. And uh, when we're listening, when we're um, receiving a packet, it could be about three um, milliamps. But because BLE, the radios are not on all the time, you can see the, uh, the kind of on off features here. Uh, we were measuring average currents of about 25 microamps um, with a um, BLE radio advertising and being connected. Um, so here we are. Um, what effect does the output power, you know, we can turn up the, the power of our radio to increase the range. What effect does that have on, um, on the power consumption of a Bluetooth radio? Again, here with the QN9080, we can see that there's a very, very marginal increase in uh, power consumption. Um, the bottom plot is showing outputting um, at zero dBm, 2.9 milliamps. Um, if we turn the radio up to uh, plus two dBm, uh, we saw a, a 500 microamp increase in power. So I would say don't be frightened of turning the output power of your radios up um, to, uh, to increase range. Um, but make sure you do some tests uh, in the lab and understand the power versus uh, output power uh, kind of conundrum. Well, uh, okay, all very clever, lots of radio standards. What one do I choose? Um, where do I get hardware and what about software? Well, the first decision really is whether you go for a module or a chip down solution. Um, on the left hand side, I show a, uh, a microcontroller with a built in radio. It's a um, device called a KW41Z from NXP. And on the right hand side, I show the same chip pre-made into a module and um, pros and cons for each. Um, obviously a chip down approach is the uh, most cost effective because uh, you're just paying for the chip. Um, maybe suitable for 100,000 units kind of uh, that you manufacture. Um, because it requires specialist knowledge, you'll have to do the RF design, you'll have to do the certification and that's got a 30K pound kind of cost attached to it. On the right hand side, at higher cost is buying in a module, and that would be very suitable for prototyping and perhaps up to 50K annual volume production. Um, the advantage being that all of the RF certifications are completed and you could just use it as a component, probably with a built in antenna and without any radio kind of uh, design to be done. Uh, one consideration when you're looking at a radio um, is. Uh, how are you going to connect it to your uh, microcontroller? It might be a single chip, um, could be a, um, a Bluetooth radio, which is all in um, one um, device. You've got the microcontroller and the radio all in the, uh, the one part. Um, the QN9080 would be an example of that. Um, but then it might be that you've got a separate radio and a separate microcontroller. That's quite common for LoRa or for, for Sigfox. And then how do you connect the two? Would it be UR or SPY, I squared C? Um, if it's Wi-Fi, the photograph in the top right-hand corner is um, me working on a um, uh, M2 radio module from um, Urata. And you can see it's connected into the SD card slot on that development board. Um, and the interface to the radio module is um, over um, SDIO. Um, it's important to be picking the radio and the microcontroller at the same time and understanding the link between the two. And understanding the impact that that link might have on the bandwidth that you can get from the microcontroller to the, uh, to the radio, perhaps one megabit for the UART. Um, 
maybe um, you've got a 40 megahertz link between your microcontroller and the SDIO um, port uh, to the radio. Um, but it's important to kind of make those decisions as you're designing your architecture and don't just pick a radio because you wanted to use Zigbee um, and find that you've got to pick a particular microcontroller to, uh, to use that interface. Um, as an example, here's a, a Zigbee module. This comes from Arrow's partner, Azure Wave. And um, this is a very convenient, small, we call it a stamp form factor. If you look in the picture, you can see the castellations around uh, three sides of the board. You can surface mount this uh, perhaps just with the antenna off the edge of the board and just treat it as a surface mount component. Um, very convenient, pre-certified. You can see uh, FCC certification there. And uh, I believe that uh, this module also has contains a, a NXP JN5169 and would be certified uh, the Zigbee uh, with um, in Europe as well. Uh, what about Wi-Fi? Uh, Wi-Fi is quite complex. Obviously, we need um, a, a stack. We need, um, you know, a Wi-Fi module. And um, uh, I blog on this MCU on Eclipse.com site, and uh, I connected a Cortex M33 microcontroller based on LPCs, LPC 55S69, to a um, a micro uh, Wi-Fi 10 clickboard. Um, that took me a matter of minutes to uh, to plug the board in and have code running and connect it to my home network. It was a very, very pleasing experience. Um, and that just shows you if you get the, the right board, the right module, and the right microcontroller with the software available, things can be very, very straightforward and easy. Um, that particular example, the software came, um, was a free download from NXP. Um, with a software called MCU Expresso SDK. That's the software development kit for, for that board. And highlighted, I show you um, that that download comes with the Cypress Wicked Wi-Fi framework and also with uh, Wi-Fi Qualcomm library and with NXP's recent acquisition of Broadcom some of the Broadcom modules are in the process of being supported as well. And that software download comes with the IP stack called Lightweight IP, LWIP. And even not highlighted, but in the line below the TCP IP networking stack, you can see the software is bundled with embed TLS um, security software. So uh, even doing kind of TLS security uh, on the uh, on our sensor network uh, can be enabled with that one free download. It was a very very easy way of getting started with uh, with Wi-Fi, uh, with very easily available modules and uh, software that just downloaded and worked. Um, it was a joy to use. Um, other partners of Arrow and NXP are um, Murata and Cypress. So. Uh, here are some Wi-Fi modules that um, uh, are available and are supported by um, the combination of NXP, their MCU Expresso SDK, and Cypress Wicked. The water meter on my desk is using the 1MW M.2 um, network. It's a module. It's the second one in the list there, and um, that's a um, well, Wi-Fi AC um, compliant uh, compatible module with um, built in BLE 5.0 as well. Nice thing to use. Um, here's another um, Wi-Fi module, uh, this time um, again from Azure Wave. And this is an example of some of the modules supported in uh, NXP software. Murata modules are supported um, on uh, NXP's um, IMX RT 1050 and 1060 boards. And there are three different kind of ways of um, building in these Murata modules, either as a standalone module, that's a drawing on the left-hand side, um, through a, um, 
adapter board um, M2 module. You can see that in the middle, it's got an M2 um, connector and very easily plugs into um, your target hardware. Or the kind of prototyping board is the one on the right hand side, which is the uh, micro SD to M2 adapter. And this will then enable you to plug in a, a Murata Wi-Fi module uh, into any board that's got a, well, supporting software and a micro SD socket. Um, and that was the way that I was working uh, with the water meter, uh, well, even earlier today. OK, here's another drawing of the same thing. So that's the uh, adapter board in the middle that converts the M2 Murata module into a micro SD socket. OK, uh, another drawing of the Murata modules and um, uh, this is the one MW. So that gives you AC. So that's kind of Wi-Fi 5, 5 gigahertz and a very cost effective module uh, for, for a sensor network. Um, if you're interested in costs, Arrow will be able to, uh, to come give you some indicative pricing um, on any of these modules after the call. OK, so that draws my kind of lightning kind of whiz through um, sensor networks and what radios might be considered. Um, my developer perspective is, you know, I, I need to consider all of the various aspects, range, power consumption that I need for my system before I go and choose the radio standard. And so my advice is don't just pick a radio standard because you've seen some marketing or you saw a presentation on Bluetooth or thread or Wi-Fi, but understand the implications for your network, understand the sensor topology that you need for your system and pick the radio module or the radio solution that best meets your needs. So with that, I'll say thank you very much and open it up for any questions. And I don't know if uh, Liz or, or Zane have been keeping an eye as we've been going through but uh, very happily take questions now if they're ready to be asked. At the moment, there aren't any questions on chat. I think you've uh, answered all the critiques there, Mark. Fantastic. Well, um, in that case, it's uh, for me to say thank you for all those uh, who've attended and listened uh, for your time this morning. And I will just pass back to Liz for uh, any closing comments. Brilliant. Well, if anyone does have any further questions, please do feel free to email them through to me afterwards. Um, and I can certainly pass them on to the speakers today. Um, big thank you to Charles and Mark for their insightful and thorough presentations. Hopefully it has given you all um, an overview of the different cellular modules and network architecture that can be considered when developing IoT applications and innovations. Um, equally, hopefully it's shown the different use cases for 5G technologies in commercial deployment. Um, I know we've covered sort of smart cities, process automation, and even within the home environment. So hopefully it's given you a good food for thought when developing and choosing what networks to use. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this webinar. As I said, we will circulate both the link to the session and the slides for you to have a more thorough look through. Um, if you would like to join us for the next one, the session will focus on industrial 4.0 technologies and um, that will be held two weeks today. So Tuesday, the 2nd of June at 10 a.m. Um, it is a popular topic, so do sign up to guarantee your place and we will email the link through to you to sign up once you've registered. Um, full, date, full details of that session and the other remaining webinars in the Arrow Comes Home series that will be run throughout June can be found on the Census City website. So if you go to censuscity.co.uk and then click on the events tab, the full schedule of available upcoming webinars will be listed there. So many thanks again for joining us. Um, do keep in touch and hopefully we'll see you in two weeks time for the next session. Thank you.